Good morning, my name is Karen. I work for St. Mary's Andover. I'm really, really excited to have with me today Keith Betton, who is an expert on peregrines and birds of prey. I'm part of the team at St. Mary's, as I said, and I have been involved in installing the peregrine camera. This is an amazing, amazing camera where you can really get close to these beautiful birds. We do urge you to look at them on the camera rather than coming to the church itself, partly because they are sensitive birds, but also because of social distancing, which we are observing at the moment. If you do find yourself there in person, please observe those guidelines, we'd be ever so grateful. I'm gonna hand over to Keith in just a moment to tell us all about these birds. But firstly, I'd like to tell you that in the description of this video, you can see the link for the Peregrine Cam. So if you haven't found it yet, please do have a look and enjoy watching these birds. So Keith, welcome. Thank you. We were originally going to do this talk in person, of course, circumstances have changed and I'm really delighted to welcome you onto our camera here instead to give this talk. So thank you, thank you very much. Could you just start by telling us a little bit about yourself, please, and how you became passionate about peregrines? Well, I'm the county bird recorder for Hampshire and I'm also chairman of the Hampshire Ornithological Society. And about 10 years ago, we realized that uh, actually we didn't know very much about peregrines in Hampshire. We knew they were around, but we'd get a bit of information about maybe a possible nest somewhere, but, but people wouldn't follow through and check to see if anything happened. And so a small team developed and we decided to study them. And uh, we've now got around about 20 sites across Hampshire where we do watch the peregrines and we also make sure that if there are any issues with the people who own the buildings, they need some advice or whatever, then we're able to make sure the peregrines get the very best chance of succeeding. And we've installed a few boxes as we've discussed and that works well, although frankly, we'd rather leave them to it if they're able to nest without needing our involvement, but sometimes they need our help and, and that's what we're here to do. That's fantastic. And if you could just tell us then, how did you first become involved with the Andover peregrines? Well, I heard about the fact that there were peregrines sitting on the roof in Andover about, hmm, about five years ago. And I contacted local bird watchers. I, I don't live in Andover myself. I'm actually just over on the, on the northeast corner of Hampshire. And um, people kept coming back and saying, yep, they're there, they're there. And then uh, the female, there was a male and female, the female disappeared. Um, and then another female arrived, but this female was actually too young. So this was two years ago. She would have been just one year old and she's got an orange ring on her leg. And we can talk about that later. Uh, that means we can identify her very precisely. She was born near Guildford three years ago now, but at that time she was one year old. She was too young to breed. So, um, she stayed there throughout the year. Um, and I think that's when I made contact with you and said, look, how about we, we do something to help them because they, they may need somewhere in the church in the top to try and uh, get a nesting site. Quite often when they nest in, on churches, they go into a little corner of, by a wall or something. And when it rains, it just gets flooded. And it rained a few days ago, huge amount of rain. So putting a box in was a good idea. And you very kindly agreed. And we did that and the very next year, uh, last year, of course, they nested, and here we are once again, they've nested again. And the great news is that only about 20 minutes ago before starting this recording, I saw the chick, the very first chick, hatch. Um, there were at least 45 people watching at that point uh, on various places, perhaps from all around the world, and we could hear the chick calling as it was trying to make its way out of the egg. Very special. I've been watching them for 10 years. I've never seen that before. That's absolutely incredible. So now that we've got our first chick, our first baby, <laughs> um, what can we expect to happen over the next few weeks? People watching the camera, what might they see? Well, first of all, the first three chicks usually hatch around about the same time. Um, although they've been laid, the eggs are laid on different days, of course, the female has to wait a couple of days between each egg. Um, she doesn't start incubating them until the third ones appear. And so therefore they all get the same amount of heat. They all hatch pretty much together. So the other two uh, eggs, two and three, we expect to hatch either later today or maybe tomorrow or perhaps overnight. Um, the fourth one, that's not so easy um, because we have four eggs. So the fourth egg sometimes at this point gets left to one side because with three chicks, there's a lot going on there and maybe they, they don't really want a fourth chick. 
um, or possibly it may hatch, but it'll hatch quite a bit later, maybe three days later. Um, so that chick has quite a tough time. It'll be always the smallest in the brood until they're, they're well grown and probably have to fight quite hard to get food because uh, they're, they're quite pushy, these, these chicks. So for the next uh, 10 days or so, the female will be incubating those babies. She will be brought food by the male. He will occasionally take over as well because he does a bit of incubation. He's not quite as good at it because he's actually a smaller bird. They're always smaller males um, and therefore he can't cover them quite so easily. He will come backwards and forwards with food and then after about 10 days they will really be wanting lots of food so she will go out and feed them as well so they'll they'll be left alone. I guess uh, three weeks down the line they'll start losing that lovely white down and they'll become a little bit browner. You'll see the feathers coming through, proper brown feathers initially because baby peregrines are brown not grey and um, I guess in about seven weeks time so I don't know when that's going to be uh, middle of June, middle of June, third week of June, you're going to start seeing them maybe doing practice flights. We'll probably put the camera out wider at that point so you can see them. They usually sit on the wall, flapping away, exercising the wings, and if you're lucky, you might even get to see a first flight. They quite often get it wrong. Um, you know, when you're a peregrine and you, you're on a building and you jump off, you've got to hopefully get it right, and if you don't, you'll be on the ground. So that's where, again, the church staff come in, because uh, if you find one on the ground, then you're gonna have to scoop it up, put it in a box, take it back up the top again. So I think that's probably you, Karen, actually. Uh, I think that probably would be, and I, for one, am praying that they do their flight successfully, because to get onto the tower, one has to go up a vertical ladder, which yep. is not for the faint-hearted, especially <laughs> as it's over a lot of bells. And uh, yes, I, Nature, I will try to be brave. I, I'm sure you'll do it. <laughs> Nature is important. <laughs> Absolutely. I would do my best. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Keith, um, for that little introduction. We'll go now into the talk that you were going to give us. I'm going to share my screen. So just tell me when you'd like the next slide. And hopefully for all of you watching, this works well. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much indeed, Karen. I'll now start going through the talk. So this is a talk I've done many times, and uh, I hope I will get to do it for real in Andover when we're allowed to, but um, here we go. So the return of the peregrine, and it is a return because this is a bird that originally was quite widespread in the UK, but unfortunately its numbers were decimated by several things. I'll talk about those in a moment. Um, and, and it has returned. Numbers are now very good once again. So next slide, please, Karen. Um, the peregrine's head is um, very impressive. Uh, are you able to do the next slide? There we go. Uh, it's very impressive. It's got uh, really good eyesight. I don't know quite how many times better than ours, but clearly peregrines can see things a lot quicker than we can. They can see a, a small bird or a pigeon or something flying towards it from probably about a mile away. Um, so they're really designed for superb flight and superb eyesight. And uh, of course that beak is designed for ripping open the bodies of the birds that it kills. Almost always it's killing a bird. I've heard reports of them catching rabbits, but really what they do is they catch birds, particularly birds in flight. So the next slide, I'm gonna run through one or two books because people like to have books to read. And the one on the right is very well known by J.A. Baker, The Peregrine. It's a classic bit of literature, all about his studies of the peregrine some years ago. And the other one there, uh, Dick Trelevin did a book on his work in uh, Cornwall, I think, uh, looking at the peregrines on the cliffs. Moving on, the next slide shows us um, a book that's been issued twice now by Derek Ratcliffe. It is the absolute masterpiece on the peregrine falcon. That's the one that I always read when I want to know the deep facts about these birds. Two editions of that. And then the, after that, the next slide, a couple of recent books. Um, Patrick Sterling Eyre did a book on peregrine falcon. Lots of great photos in that one. And then on the right, um, Ed Druitt, a friend of mine, did a book called Urban Peregrines. And that's very appropriate to what we're having in Andover where the birds are nesting right in amongst us. So all of those are available if you want to see them. So the next slide shows you uh, peregrine falcon in its natural situation, because in the natural world, 
you'd expect to get these birds out in wet, dreary places, mountains, moorlands, sea cliffs, not in the middle of a town like Andover. So they are used to living fairly rough life. So when you see a peregrine looking soaking wet and cold, that's actually what they're designed to be. So don't worry about that. And uh, just moving on the next slide, you can see there the, the shape of the wing. This is uh, the fastest flying bird in the world, which means it's also the fastest flying animal. It can go at over 200 miles an hour when it's actually in pursuit of its prey. And if you look at the next slide, you can see they're very agile. They're able to turn quite quickly. You see the shape of the wing there, the tail fanned out, giving it a bit of a break because it wants to turn and go, go to the right. And the next slide shows you what it looks like when it starts to get ready to go into the hunt. Now, it'll be up maybe five, 600 feet. It'll have spotted something uh, flying past that it wants to catch. And it then turns itself into the shape of a missile. The next photo shows you the shape of the bird as it comes down like a torpedo at incredible speed. So it can, as I say, do over 200 miles an hour, which is like a Formula One race car. It's an amazing speed. Um, the main prey, which is the next slide, is uh, uh, the feral pigeon, the town pigeon we have, which you find on the streets of Andover. Plenty of those around, so lots of food for them. And considered a pest actually by quite a lot of towns and town councils, so they're probably quite delighted that the numbers may be a little lower than before. But there are quite a wide range of things that peregrines will eat. And the next slide shows you a pie chart from um, some work done by Nick Dixon and, uh, and Ed Druitt down in Exeter where they looked at the prey. So you can see that orange part of the circle is the pigeons that were being caught in Exeter, so about a third of the food was pigeons, but also other small things like thrushes and starlings and uh, sparrows and so on. And quite a, an interesting slice there, 11% wading birds. They, they do like eating wading birds. And of course, Exeter, you're very close to the sea uh, and to the estuary. So that's why there were wading birds there. There will be some wading birds also in Andover. We had a bar-tailed godwit turned up in the prey items recently also very sadly, a lapwing, which I rather like. Uh, I think we've had golden plover, and I think we've also had a woodcock, so yeah. Anyway, next slide is um, a list of um, birds that uh, have been brought in, again by the same study, and you can see there's a really large variety of species there. So not just pigeons. Pigeons are the favorite. After all, they've, they've quite a lot of meat on them. They're very good to eat. Um, uh, plenty of muscle on them as well. But there are some interesting birds on there. If you move down to the next slide, uh, you'll see a photo of a few. Um, we've got a uh, storm petrel there on the top left, black neck grebe, top right, a dipper, uh, bottom left, and bottom right, even a ruddy duck, which is an American species that escaped from captivity about 30 years ago and was thought to be a pest. So, um, yeah, quite a variety. So um, moving down, the next slide is, uh, is actually probably what you get to see for the very last thing you see if you're a pigeon about to be killed in the middle of Andover. A uh, bit of a scary sight, I have to say. So let's get some facts and figures about peregrines. Um, the next slide gives you all of those. You can see, first of all, male and female are different sizes. I mentioned this earlier. So you can see there the male um, between 580 and 750 grams, and the female 925 or so to 1300. In fact, she can even be bigger than that. So the female peregrine is always bigger than the male. And as you can see, even the smallest female is still bigger than the biggest male. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, um, the female is super aggressive. You've only got to watch our pair and you'll see that, um, you know, well, you will see quite a lot of this as he's bringing food back. He'll be sent out straight away to get more. Um, it, there's no kind of affection. It's all pretty aggressive. Um, when there's any defense of the nest, for example, like a kite or something like that, or a buzzard flying over, the female will be the one that goes after that bird. Our male's quite timid, actually. And we've noticed that he's new. He's not the male from last year. So um, he's learning his, his way around. So you can see the laying of eggs. Uh, between the 21st of March and 20th of April, a clutch of three to four eggs, 
interestingly, we've got five eggs at the moment that have just hatched at Winchester Cathedral. It's very rare to have five. And the incubation, well, around about 29 to 32 days, although actually it's, uh, it's quite variable. These birds here in Andover, they took quite a long time to hatch their eggs. It's all depending on how much warmth they get. It's a bit like boiling a kettle. If you turn the electricity off for a bit, it takes longer to boil. They fledge after about 40 days or so. But you know, in their very first year of life, mortality is quite high, up to 70% can die in the first year. It's quite a tough life. You've got to learn to hunt. You've got to be good at flying. It's a bit like being a red arrow pilot. You've got to get your skillful flying uh, learned very quickly. And if you don't, then you'll end up uh, suffering as a result. First breeding at two years old. So these chicks will be breeding hopefully in two years time. Probably not around Andover. They generally move uh, 20 miles or so from where they've been born, uh, mainly because they don't really want to be nesting with their brother or sister or their mum or dad. Um, and the oldest bird we know of is about 15 years. They probably live a bit older than that. Um, but, you know, if they can get to that age, that's pretty impressive. We saw one the other day that was 13 years old, uh, just over in Wiltshire. Right, next slide then. Here is a pair of peregrines. Now, um, the females on the left and the male on the right, now they never sit together like this, which is why that's actually a, a, a collage of two pictures. Uh, Beauty and Archer, genuine pair. Um, now you can see she is a lot bigger than him, and you can see He's actually quite cute looking, a bit like a toy. She's not. She's pretty aggressive. If you, uh, if you did get to meet Beauty up front, um, she'd probably give you a good scratch, whereas he might just run off. Uh, the way of telling a male and female peregrine apart is that the female has a little bit of buffy color. It's very variable though, on the, on the neck and the throat. And you can see that on our female in Andover, whereas the male is usually very white and shiny. And the other thing is that if you look at the eye, the eye is actually the same size in both of those birds, but because he's quite a lot smaller, he sort of looks a bit bug-eyed. Um, so male peregrines always look rather cute, a bit like a toy, um, and the female usually looks like a bit like a killing machine. Anyway, next slide, please. Um, well, reproduction has to happen. There's probably only one day in the life of a, a male peregrine where he feels like he's actually in control of what's going on, and that's it. Uh, and then shortly after that, hopefully we have babies appearing, uh, or chicks, or eggs rather. Uh, quickly moving on uh, to the next slide. Here's where they all live. So peregrine is a worldwide species, and there are 19 different races of peregrines around the world. And you can see them all listed here. They vary from being quite small in Africa to being massive up in Siberia, where, of course, being big is helpful because it helps you to keep warm. Um, quite a lot of the birds up in the very north of the range move south during the winter. Uh, I've seen the Siberian ones, for example, down in Indonesia, where they go to get away from all the cold. And indeed, here in Britain, we have birds coming from Scandinavia. So moving on to the next slide, you'll see uh, a really good book, which is for the uh, real peregrine aficionados. It goes through every single one of those races. And as you can see in that picture on the right hand side, they all vary slightly. The ones in the Middle East are actually um, a little bit more brown, like the bottom ones there, uh, and the ones in America, for example, are much darker, same in Australia. So there's quite a bit of variety and variation amongst peregrines. So moving on, we have a picture here of a buzzard and a peregrine. Now, buzzards are not welcome anywhere near peregrine nests. We've seen this actually in Andover, where the pair have got up, particularly the female, and chased off any buzzards and also kites. Now, I don't think buzzards are likely to cause much of a problem for the peregrines, but they really don't want them there. And we have quite a few cases where buzzards have been killed because they've gone too close. So buzzards generally learn to stay away. Okay, the next slide then. You probably don't think about seeing peregrines on the ground because they, as you say, they, as I said, they, they fly and they catch things. But in the winter, uh, on this field, for example, on a farm, where it's quite snowy. They sometimes will eat insects and things they find on the ground. They very often sit on the ground waiting for something to come, come past them. For m most of the time that we've known peregrines in Hampshire, they were only with us during the winter. They weren't here during the summer. And if you look at the next slide, 
it's a graph. So from left to right goes from January through to December. So bar one is January, bar 12 is December. And that's back from 1951 to 1990. And you can see that there were hardly any records of peregrines in Hampshire in the summer. And that's because they weren't breeding here in Hampshire. They were nesting on the Isle of Wight and they were nesting in one or two other places like Sussex and Dorset, uh, but they weren't with us. They were only with us in the winter. And probably quite a few of those winter birds would have been ones from Scandinavia coming here to keep uh, a bit warmer in our winter. The next slide shows you the, um, the ringing recoveries of peregrines. Now these are birds that have been tagged as babies and then they've been found later in life. So you'll see up around Scandinavia, so Norway, Sweden, and Finland, lots of yellow um, dots there. Those are all birds that were ringed as chicks in their nests in Scandinavia, which then came to Britain during the winter months. And if you look at the purple dots, which are mainly down the coast of France, and there's one in Spain, those are peregrines ringed in Britain that made it over to other countries during the winter. So you'll see our birds move south and the birds from Scandinavia move to move south as well, but they join us. So it's almost like a, um, you know, everybody changes their chair as it were and moves around one. Okay, so the problems, next slide please, the problems that peregrines face. Well, for many years, people have loved the color of the peregrine eggs. And you only had to look at those eggs in our nest in Andover and you'd see they were a beautiful, rich brown color, just like those ones uh, in the bottom right-hand corner of that, uh, that slide. So this is actually in a, um, a collection in a museum. These are all peregrine eggs. They're variable in color, um, sometimes four, sometimes two, sometimes three. And uh, they were so popular with egg collectors and they were stolen from the nests. Now the next slide shows you uh, a gentleman uh, John Walpole Bond. Now he lived in the 1800s and early 1900s and he was the expert on peregrines in Sussex and he wrote those three books, three volumes, The History of the Birds of Sussex. Indeed he put a peregrine on the second volume but he was an egg collector. He collected all the eggs of peregrines that he could find. So although he was a keen bird watcher he also took their eggs. It's amazing really that peregrines managed to survive. So their numbers were actually pushed down by uh, activities of him and, and other people like him. Of course, it's illegal now to take eggs of peregrines, but uh, back then it happened a lot. Moving on to the next slide, here we have a, uh, a racing pigeon now, or homing pigeon now. During the um, Second World War, these pigeons were used to send secret messages uh, from people who were stationed in places like France and so on, who needed to get urgent messages back to the UK to report on the advance of the war. And so um, these birds were being attacked, sadly, next slide please, uh, as they came back into the UK. And the government said, right, well, we're not having this, we can't have these peregrines intercepting our, our messages. So the order went out that all the peregrines on the south coast of England had to be shot and uh, people were paid money to shoot them and uh, almost every single peregrine was uh, was blasted out of existence it's very sad but i guess you could understand at that time why they did that the next slide shows you that uh, peregrines really do like their pigeons there's one sitting on a pylon um, just actually um, ripping open the body of the, of the pigeon and the next slide shows you soldiers releasing a pigeon with a secret message. So it really was an important thing uh, in the Second World War to not have these, these pigeons intercepted as they came back to Britain. So of course that ended after the war, nobody was allowed to shoot peregrines anymore. But then their third problem came, and that's with the next slide. And here what you can see is a whole range of insecticides, very powerful pesticides that were developed during the 1950s, particularly in early 60s, and these were really strong. They were put onto seed and grain uh, crops so that they would grow faster and better without uh, having insects on them. Now, small birds ended up eating the seeds, peregrines ended up eating the small birds, and being at the end of the food chain, the peregrine was the one to suffer. And as a result, a lot of peregrines died. They died and also their eggshells became very thin and that meant that they cracked in the nest and the chicks never hatched. 
Peregrine numbers absolutely plummeted. And there's actually another problem, and that's the next slide. And this one still goes on today. There are people, I'm afraid, who do not like birds of prey, and they do not like peregrines, uh, either because they're uh, perhaps pigeon fanciers who don't like the fact that their, their birds are attacked on, on their movements, or they might be people on grouse moors or whatever who just simply don't like birds of prey. And what you can see there is a spring trap. That bird, of course, had to be killed. Um, the trap was put next to the nest, and as it came back to feed its chicks, the bird ended up being uh, snared like that. Terrible thing to happen. And of course, if you do that, you're going to likely go to prison or at least have a very large fine if caught. Right, now the next slide gives you a map showing the distribution of peregrines back when I was a boy in the 1960s and early 70s. And you can see um, in England, there were very few peregrines. All of those birds along the south coast have been shot and over the whole country, particularly in farming areas, birds had really declined. They were so careful about not revealing where some of those nesting birds were. They put them, for example, the ones in Cornwall and Devon were put in a circle all lumped together so nobody knew where they really were. But anyway, that was the situation, well, 40 years ago or so. And now if we move on to the next slide, you can see the situation from the most recent set of surveys done, um, well, almost 10 years ago now. And uh, you can see that peregrines have now spread. Uh, every one of those little red triangles, which you can see, is an area where peregrines have moved into where they weren't found in the original survey. So you can see all across Hampshire, much of southern England, there are now peregrines. Next slide, please. And you can see here, actually, in Europe, the situation's a lot better too. All those upward facing arrows show places where peregrines are doing well, they're getting more common and uh, they're spreading, they've got a bigger distribution. So uh, only one, two places there I can see downward arrows. So that's good. Moving on to the next slide, there's a detailed map of southern England and you can see all those triangles where those peregrines uh, came, came to nest. Now in some cases they were there already before, before they got to uh, killed, uh, such as Sussex and, and Dorset and the Isle of Wight. But as I said, Hampshire, they'd never been. So you can see from that uh, chart on the left, they came to Hampshire in 1993, the very first nesting attempt from peregrines. And I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment. The next slide shows you some results from some surveys over the years. Now we do this every 10 years or so, looking at peregrine numbers. And you can see back in the 1960s, just under 400 pairs, and now, uh, well, around about 1,800 pairs or so, probably by now, maybe 2,000. The numbers really have gone up more and more. Uh, the next slide, please, shows you that actually that change is not equal across the country. So this is the comparison between the survey recently, well, in 2014, and the one 12 years before that. And you can see in Wales and Scotland and the Isle of Man, numbers actually have gone down. And in England, the numbers have gone up. 76% increase just between those two surveys. So we're the place where peregrines are doing well. Uh, in other places, in Scotland and so on, they're not doing so well. And that is actually um, partly down to pollution. Uh, there's quite a lot of pollution in the sea now. And some of the birds in Scotland feed on seabirds and they're therefore taking on board mercury and things like that. So we've got the eggshell thinning all over again. And also there are, I'm afraid, quite a lot of people um, in Scotland who don't like birds of prey uh, much more than in England, and they are a bit inclined to shoot birds when they shouldn't. So moving on, um, let's talk about what happened in Hampshire. So this is a very famous chimney. This is the Fawley Power Station. And that chimney is due to come down actually this autumn. Um, might, might be delayed now, who knows, but that is the, the Fawley Power Station chimney and that's where they nested in 1993. And indeed they've nested every year since then. They nest actually just below the bit where at the top where it's the white bit. Um, I always think it looks like an upside down cigarette, um, but the, the, just below the white bit, there's a, a small opening and that's where they nest each year. It's not, they're not going to nest this year because it's been blocked off just to make sure they don't because they want to be able to bring that chimney down. Uh, the next slide shows you the next place they nested. So they nested in 1995 
in, um, in the outskirts of Southampton and um, they nested on a pylon. Now, I do like nesting on pylons. There's probably five or six nests on pylons in Hampshire and they usually go for these ones where the, the insulators are kind of horizontal rather than hanging down. Um, there's a little space I'll show you later where they can nest there. Um, so that's where they started moving into there. And then the next slide is, uh, is, an, is a funny one. This is um, a crane called Canute. Now this is a floating crane and Canute uh, moves around the docks in Southampton and basically is able to go to ships that need things lifted off to the docks. So para peregrines nested on Canute and didn't seem to mind that Canute had to kind of move around the harbour and go to the different places in the docks. It's a mobile nest. But it was a bit of a surprise actually, and if you just move to the next slide, that uh, Canute had to do a lifting job on the Isle of Wight. So for a couple of days, Canute was floated all the way down to Cowes on the Isle of Wight with the female peregrine sitting on the nest, actually on the crane. So she went all the way to the Isle of Wight, um, spent a couple of days there, and then came back again. The male stayed in Southampton, um, I suppose, defending the territory, but the female stayed with the nest. Um, and quite an interesting thing is if you look in the Isle of Wight bird report for 2004, it actually reports the nesting of uh, peregrines, but just two days only on the Isle of Wight, um, which I thought was a bit cheeky, really. The Hampshire birds, nothing to do with the Isle of Wight, but there we go. We'll get our own back one day. So the next slide shows you the increase over the last few years. Now, I haven't quite updated this slide yet, but you can see from the left hand end with 1993, just one pair. It was a pretty slow increase until about 10 years ago or so. Um, that also coincided with us setting up our study group. So we became much more aware of what was really going on. Um, in 2018, we had 25 nests where there was nesting activity. It went down actually last year to about 17. This year, I'm certainly aware of 15 nests already, although of course not being able to get out and look. Um, I guess between, you know, it's going to be between 15 and 20 every year now, um, because that's the sort of number of peregrines we have. Anyway, next slide shows you a peregrine flying in and uh, disturbing a flock of birds. Quite a lot of my friends who like counting birds get rather frustrated when they see a peregrine arrive because all the birds take off, so they have to start all over again. But um, I have to say, um, it's a fantastic thing to have peregrines. So. I don't think I'd mind, uh, it's a small price to pay. Um, and if you look at the next slide, you'll see we've got um, peregrine there flying over a city in England. We now have these birds actually living alongside us. And what's happened is that peregrines have changed the, their behavior. So the first nesting in urban areas was only really about 30 years ago when they started nesting on churches and tall buildings. And I'm a strong believer on the fact that if they are born on a building, then they'll think about nesting on a building as well. And uh, we've certainly noticed this increase. About half the peregrines in England um, are, are now actually born on buildings or at least man-made structures. Um, and that's almost all the ones in Hampshire. It's about three or four examples where they're in quarries as well. Moving on, um, those of you who go to Chichester Cathedral may recognize that. There's the peregrine sitting there. They've been nesting there for 30 years or so now, and um, they've done really, really well. There's something like 60 or 70 chicks now raised from that nest with different parents taking over. And I think the nest site has changed position slightly every year as well. But um, that's, that's a good example. The next slide shows you a, um, a bird on a building in Southampton, and uh, they do love these big tower blocks. That's not a problem for really, uh, as long as the owners of the building are prepared to let them get on with it. And occasionally I have to uh, negotiate with them to go up on the roof a bit less often than they would do normally. Um, the next slide shows you what you can see if you've got a building and you've got peregrines nesting. So you may have noticed that in Andover, um, the, the pair actually store their food just away from the camera on a bit of a flat roof. And uh, here is an example of what you would call a larder or a cache of food, freshly, freshly caught, sometimes not so fresh actually. Um, and they will go to that and um, a bit like going to the fridge, getting some, some food for the chicks. And um, you've got a variety of wading birds there. So that's obviously a nest site that's quite close to the coast. 
Next slide. Um, is a, a, another interesting one. This is another nest site in Hampshire. So this is the container port down on Southampton Water. So if you look on the left-hand side, you can see Southampton Water, you can see a line of cranes and a load of very large ships having the containers taken off and uh, moved into that, um, that uh, collection of the, all, the, all the containers. So uh, a pair nested actually on one of those cranes. And if you look on the, the next slide, you'll see the, the actual cranes. They're absolutely massive. I don't know, they're probably about 200 feet high um, and a pair nested up there. They found an old crow nest and um, they, they got their chicks, but very sadly, and the next slide shows you this, the, um, one of the chicks, I'm afraid, got tangled up in some wire and cabling and because crows make their nests out of any old rubbish, bits of wire and twine, and this poor chick, uh, it just couldn't survive, so it died. So I got a call, was asked if I could do something about that ahead of next year, and here's the result. The next slide you can see, we got made a uh, box. This is our very first box. We've got about 10 of them now, and um, this box was made to a certain size, and we put some very fine gravel inside that. That's the kind of sort of potting gravel, I suppose, horticultural grit, I think is what it's called, or fish tank gravel. And the birds were able to make their nest in there. And if you um, go to the next slide, you can see the kind of mixture we have. That's in one of our nests. Um, and uh, the next slide shows you um, the, the box being put in position before the gravel goes in. Uh, there we are about 200 feet up and the birds came straight back. We put the box exactly where they tried to nest before and uh, they took to it immediately. And um, the next slide shows you a rather grainy photograph from back in 2014, but within two months of putting the box up, there's the female with her eggs uh, on the 26th of March. So that was a very pleasing uh, thing. We had about five or six years of, um, about five years of nesting in that box and uh, very successful. Um, over to the next slide. And this is um, no longer in existence, but this is the old police HQ in, uh, in um, Winchester. And, and this was, uh, you can see the peregrines just sitting on the top ledge, probably the safest place to nest really. I mean, no one's gonna climb up the police HQ unless they're completely stupid. Um, and they nested on the roof. They didn't do too well because they got flooded as far as we can tell. Um, so we put a box up. If you go to the next slide, you can see us up on the roof installing the box and uh, there it is it's strapped down because of course it's quite windy up there and um, they were very quick to to take to that they loved it um, the next slide shows you another one this is Forley refinery and if you see on the right hand side there's a little kind of gantry on the top of uh, the chimney there again a very tall chimney and uh, we got a box installed up there and the peregrines nested straight away so Again, lots of success stories with peregrines where you give them a little bit of help and they just do the rest. Now the nest you may have noticed isn't really much to talk about. It's a little dent in the gravel and both male and female have a go at making that. If you look at the next photograph, you've probably, if you've been watching the camera, been seeing the birds going in and they do this kind of tobogganing thing where they push themselves along with the, with the back, with the feet out the back, uh, making this little dent which they, they keep on doing. I mean, it just makes it a little bit deeper each time. Um, and if you look at the next slide, there's the bird looking rather proud uh, for its efforts. That's the male taking a selfie and um, very pleased with his efforts at making the nest. Not long after that, you'll have the eggs. And here, the next photograph, you can see the eggs. They really are gorgeous in color, lovely reddish color. Um, that's on a natural nest though, on a, on a mountain. And fairly soon you're going to see what we have in the very next slide, which is the parents with perhaps one unhatched egg um, and the babies. Now there's probably three babies in there and that's probably the fourth egg that, as I said, sometimes doesn't get to hatch simply because there's too much going on underneath that peregrine to keep it warm. Um, although I have to say Winchester Cathedral, they've hatched all five of their chicks, so they've done very well indeed. So we'll have to wait and see. Um, the next slide shows you what they will look like in about uh, three and a half weeks time. So, well, three to four, that's when they start to become 
little personalities. They when they're when they're very young, you can just go up and pick them up and have a look. And at this point, when they're this age, you go in and you're going to get attacked. So they've already got um, a very good understanding that you're not what they're going to be seeing normally, and you're going to get attacked with their feet. Um, but they are quite cute. The next slide shows you just how cute they are. That's a little bit younger. That's about three weeks old. You can see both those birds have had a very good meal. You can see the crop, which is where the sort of top of the chest is, um, is very swollen on that left hand one. So it's obviously just had a very good meal, um, as has the one on the right. You can see the difference in size there. Those birds, um, well, it could be that the one on the left is a female and one on the right is a male, but more likely that one on the right was later in hatching. It does take a while to catch up. And as I mentioned, has to be quite tough in getting a bit of attention from the parents and, um, and getting fed. You'll see the size of the feet there, big feet really from the start um, and, uh, and big claws too. You'll see an orange ring on that left hand bird. We put orange rings on all of the peregrines where we can actually access the nest. That means we're able to follow that bird. Whenever it's seen, we'll know where it's gone and, and how it's getting on. And uh, they also get a metal ring with a bit more detail on. So we may well ring the chicks at Andover, just have to see if we're allowed to do that. Um, but it would be great if we can. We've already seen one of last year's chicks um, actually in Norfolk about three or four weeks ago. So she's already moved all the way to Norfolk, about 150 miles. Um, the next slide shows you again the ring. And here you've got a bird that we, we actually just put it down after the ringing. Um, and there it is just waiting to be put back into the nest. But you can see the length of the legs. Peregrines have very long legs that you don't realize it actually when they are just standing around, but they've got very powerful legs designed to be able to catch um, things very easily. Now, when they um, first emerge as chicks from the nest, I'll say that's about seven weeks to come now, uh, middle of June, you'll see what happens here, the next slide. And this is where, this is where Karen gets to go up the ladder. Um, and, and here you've got a bird that's jumped out, taken its first flight, hasn't done all that well, well, has managed to land, but it's managed to land on the wall. So it's clinging to the side of a wall, wondering what on earth to do next. And occasionally we have them doing that. They'll literally stay frozen like that for quite a long time um, and eventually maybe come down. Uh, and sometimes, next slide, you'll see they end up on the ground and maybe Looking a bit, um, looking a bit poorly. So that's where we have to get them back up in the box again, so they have a second chance. This particular bird actually had ingested some lead. Um, lead is used in pellets when pigeons and things like that are shot, and uh, although it's being phased out, hopefully, but this bird had ingested some lead. So we got it to the Hawk Conservancy over at Wayhill, and they did a brilliant job. They, they uh, next slide. They, um, they looked after it and got it back to uh, good health, got, got the lead sorted out, and gosh, it looks so much better there, really, really bright. And, and the next slide shows it um, back in its box. But sadly, of course, all the other peregrines had gone uh, because it had been in care for 10 days and all the other peregrines had departed with their parents. So this, um, this peregrine was on its own. I thought, oh, you know, we're going to end up having to do something about this if we're not careful. Maybe Maybe I've got to, have to find a foster parent for it, which you can sometimes do if they've got the same age chicks still in the nest. They, they don't count the chicks, they just, an extra chick appears, they just feed it. But anyway, they've gone. So I actually got in my car right below the crane where this bird had nested, and I played peregrine calls from my car stereo as loud as I could do it with all the doors open. And the parents heard this from wherever they were, and they came in and they then found their chick and they took their chick away. So a happy ending to a pretty worrying story uh, before that. Now a quick um, few more photos before we finish. Um, next slide shows something you may notice around the, uh, the church and that is one of the adult peregrines um, teaching the chicks how to hunt. So here is a poor pigeon being dragged along, probably a dead pigeon I have to say, um, being dragged along by the adult and the chicks are chasing in the hope of catching it. So it's, it's really practicing the whole business of catching something in midair. So you might spot that. And if you like pigeons, I'm sorry about that. 
Um, but, you know, nature's like that, I'm afraid, sometimes. And the next slide is um, a cathedral, actually, uh, I, think it's, I think it's Norwich, but anyway, one of the cathedrals in, in East Anglia, and they had a pair of peregrines nesting. If you look at the next slide, you'll see there they are as a brood of four. Um, you can't easily see all four of them, but there are four there. And they were all just stretching. That's what they look like when they're about five or six weeks old, getting ready to depart. Uh, that's when they sometimes fall out of the nest by mistake and have to be recovered by Karen. Um, so anyway, uh, the next slide shows uh, something quite tragic. This is actually um, a bird just about to fall out of the nest. And what happened is that the, um, a rogue female peregrine came into the area and decided she wanted to have this nest site. And she also wanted to take over from the female that was there. So she killed the female and she then proceeded to kill each of the chicks one by one. I think some of them were rescued in time because people realized what was going on, seeing as it was on a camera. But you know, you do get this sometimes. Um, you know, rogue female peregrines will come in, and we had a similar situation at Salisbury Cathedral where a female peregrine came in and tried to fight with the existing female who did manage to push her away. But uh, they're pretty aggressive. You don't want to fight a female peregrine, it's not good. So, um, almost done now. A quick look at the next slide. Um, one of the things I mentioned is we uh, have these peregrines with colour rings on. And the good thing about them is that um, they do spend quite a lot of their time preening and, you know, uh, scratching and whatever. So you get to see the leg ring. I mean, I was going to tell you that we train them to show us the ring whenever we're looking, but that's really not true and you probably wouldn't believe me. So no, they just do it naturally. They're always preening. So we get a chance to see the numbers on the rings. So we'll get to know each of these birds individually if we ring them. Um, also, next slide. As a bird takes off, you can also see the ring there. So if you've got a camera, you've got a chance of uh, seeing that. Um, and the next slide. Um, my screen's just gone blank for a moment, but I'll just um, hopefully get rid of that. Uh, anyway, I hope you can still see me. The next slide is a bird flying uh, along. And again, you can see, you can see the, the ring uh, on the other side. And the next slide shows you uh, a couple of pylons. And what we've got there is the, um, the pylons that they, they go on. The, the ones that have um, the hanging down insulators, they don't like those too much. They have to have something like a crow nest in order to uh, be able to um, get any kind of where place to nest. But the ones on the right, uh, they like those with the horizontal insulators. And if you go to the next slide, you can see a couple of peregrines on a, um, a pylon and uh, the slide below that you can actually see a peregrine looking out from where the joins come together uh, and that bird has basically gone there and is making a nest in that small space. They don't really have much of a nest in there, just a bit of dust probably. Um, and then um, just the next slide shows you one of the nests in pylon and this is actually an old raven nest which the peregrines um, manage to um, use. In fact, I think in one year the ravens were in there, the next year the peregrines were in there, and I think in one year the ravens got in early and they'd finished by March, so the peregrines moved in in March, so they, uh, they're very good at using up their nests. And the final slide I thought I'd just show you is um, a shot, I absolutely love this. This is actually in Chicago in the USA, uh, and here we've got a peregrine pair that have nested in a window basket or I suppose window box you might call it on someone's apartment block uh, and there is the view as this gentleman took the photograph looking out of his sitting room out into the Chicago skyline and there he's got this uh, adult peregrine with the four chicks just sitting there and they got totally used to the fact that um, the birds were there you know and they were being watched so they didn't mind at all. I think that's absolutely superb, especially that third one along that seems to be showing a lot of interest in whatever is being seen. So Karen, thank you for doing the slides. Um, and uh, I'm obviously happy to take any questions you may have. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Keith. I absolutely love the idea that a female peregrine and her nest went on holiday to the Isle of Wight. <laughs> I think we'll ask people who are watching this, 
if you email hello at stmarysandover.org and I'll pass any questions on to Keith that he's able to answer. Just a little reminder then that if you do see the birds in person, please still observe social distancing and that in the description for this video is the link to that peregrine cam. So thank you so much, Keith. We look forward to seeing you in person, I hope, soon in Andover. I think our technology stood up pretty well, apart from my uh, little PowerPoint had a bit of a wobble near the beginning, but it seemed to recover <laughs> itself. So that was all right. So thank you very much once again, and we look forward to meeting you properly in person. Yeah, and thank you, Karen, for all the work that uh, has been done at the church. It's been really easy dealing with you, uh, getting the, the box installed and, and so on. And uh, and uh, I'm going to look forward to seeing you going up and down that ladder. Uh, I'm probably a bit heavy for it, but I think you'll be fantastic at that. So thanks for volunteering to do that. Oh, well, I have somebody in the congregation who is a fantastic help and has been really, really key in helping us do that. So I'm very grateful for him as well. A little shout out to Richard if you're watching. Thank and you I must say you. thank you to everyone who paid towards the cost of the camera, yes, which has been really good. I mean, it's such a clear camera. We've got them in several places, but this one is the best we've got, frankly, in terms of clarity uh, and everything else. So uh, really fantastic for all the people who help. Brilliant. Thank you for that, that's wonderful. We add our thanks to that as the church as well. It's been such a good community effort. So everybody stay safe, stay watching, and hopefully we'll all get to see that first flight. <laughs>